Bruchem Aboyim. Um, our class today is going to be on a uh, topic that, that, that I find interesting and questionable. That's angels. And th- the real question becomes, why does God need angels? What are, what are angels about? We know that the Torah, the Bible, talks about angels in many different places. And we kind of know of them as being messengers of God. And there are many different directions we can go. But first and foremost, um, it's really kind of strange as to why we, God would need them. Everything that happens in this world, everything we know about, I always believe is there as an instruction manual to teach us something. So I'm going to take that direction first because when God created the world, according to Midrashim, angels were created on the second day. So angels really were not the messengers, so to speak, of God creating the world. Because God had already began creating the world, and some say the whole world was actually created in a sense of all the pieces were there, and then he put them in place on each day. So the fact that the angels were not introduced until the second day, specifically for the fact to say that God did not need angels to create the world, he created the world himself. And not only that, that the world was created, even speech, that on the first day we don't have the term God said, just thought. In fact, there is a concept that says that all that exists is God, and we live in the mind of God, if you will. Maybe one reason we dream that in a dream we create a world in an instant and as long as we think about anything in that dream it exists so too with God so the question is not whether God exists the question is do we exist but that's a topic of its own so again so why does God need angels and angels become messengers of God in fact um, we know that uh, when uh, Yaakov Avinu fights with Esau's uh, angel he asks his name and he says to him that uh, a name is really irrelevant irre- because an angel's name is whatever mission he's on. So if an angel is on a mission of healing, he's refoil. And so he takes on the mission. So he's kind of neutral as to what it is, depending on what he's be doing. But so we see that in the Torah when we're reduced to the angels. Um, In fact, the 72 sages that translated the Torah into Greek, the first translation by Ptolemy, the the Greek-Syrian ruler, Um, the 72 rabbis that he had to translate the Torah from Hebrew to Greek were all put in different rooms in a ship. And they all changed certain things, like the first verse in the Torah, where it says, Bereshus bara lukem, which literally means... In the beginning created God, which sounds like whoever Boratius is created God. So they all changed it to put down God created in the beginning. And again, there's a reason why, which isn't for this lecture, as to why it was God made it that way. But they also changed the verse that said, God said to the angels, let us make man. Which they changed to let me make man. Because they didn't want anyone to think that God needed the permission or the help of angels to create man. So why did God use that terminology? Why did God say, let us make man? And the lesson is really a very great lesson. What God teaches us with angels is something that is critical for success, especially on a large, large level um, in business or in religion. In order for a person to be successful, you have to delegate. If life is predicated on only what you can do, what you can lift, what you can make, what you can accomplish, it's, it's very minimal. But if you can bring together many pieces, many people, all of a sudden you become a force. You become powerful. You, become, you have the ability to move the world. So what God's teaching us is that when he went to the angels, two things. Number one is that a person should have people underneath him, that he needs to run an operation, a, uh, a corporation of sorts, but also to include them into the process of making decisions. That when a person has an organization, that even if he makes the decisions and even if he feels that he doesn't need to 
confer with anyone. We see that God did. And the truth of the matter is, which is interesting, the angels were not in a hurry. They said that man should not be created because man would be evil. Even though what's even more interesting is that we read later on during the time of the flood that God sent angels down through them, the Nephilim, the fallen angels, so to speak. They were worse than man, even though they complained about the evil that man was perpetrating. They were even worse. They became the giants. So when, when, what God's teaching us is this important lesson. One is to delegate, and two is to bring underlings into the process of making decisions. Because it's good to hear different opinions, even if you're not going to take them, just to know. And we see that with Abravinu, Abraham, that God is visiting Abraham. And then the three Arabs come that Rashi in the commentary tell us are the three angels to visit him. And they each have a different mission. Two of them are to go to Sodom, one to save Lot, and the other one is to um, destroy the city. And one of the angels is there at the same time, one is to tell Sarah that she would have a child, his wife, but the other one's there to heal Avramvino, Abraham, from his circumcision on the third day. And the question becomes, God was there. Why does God need an angel to come and be a doctor of sorts. And we learn again another great lesson. When you go visit someone in the hospital, don't be a doctor. Not unless you have real information. Because a person is being treated in a certain way. People have a way of confusing the person and scaring the person. And all of a sudden you become a medical expert. And now the person is having a certain direction. God didn't do that. God allowed Rafoil, that angel, to heal Abravinu. He just went to visit. And that's what we need to do. So again, we learn, we learn that at the same time. Um, we see that, Abram, that God tells the angels before he destroys the world with the flood, that he goes down to earth, so to speak, to see what's going on. And we learn a great lesson that before a judge makes a decision, that the judge and jury should go to the place where the crime was perpetrated, if at all possible, to see evidence that to not take it on hearsay. If you can see something, go see it. God came down to earth where God didn't have to, and God, again, doesn't go anywhere. But still, that terminology is used for us to learn, again, that in cases of law, and in anything, ain't shmi, a career, hearing something is not like seeing something. And again, a jury as well, before they make the decision, they should have as much information and see as much as they can. Again, we learn this. We also see at Mount Sinai that when God came, he came down with the retinue of 22,000 angels. And the Jews saw this. In fact, they came down with flags. The whole concept of flags began at Mount Sinai. When the angels came down with all that grandeur, and then the Jews wanted to have the same thing that the angels had. And again, this idea of 22,000, which allude to the Hebrew alphabet, 22. And there was never a tribe that had less than 22,000. Because this, every, this, it's a special number of bringing down somehow the divinity of God. But we, now, so we see it in the business world as well. If a person wants to be, has to be a CEO, in order to run a corporation, you need to have people. If you're only going to be as good as you are, then you're small potatoes. In order to actually grow, in order to be large, what you have to do is to deal with people on all levels and to be able, much like an octopus, to have your hands everywhere, but still be in one place, to not be so scattered that you have to run everywhere to do everything because you really can't do that. And to learn to accept certain levels of reality, um, and that becomes important. One of the hardest parts of people not delegating is that they feel people just can't do it as well as they can. So it becomes important to be able to teach people, to get people to come to a certain level, to figure out how to get there. All of these things are a challenge. And what God does, by virtue of giving us, of having angels, is the fact that, again, he doesn't need them, because when he says something, it is. But yet he's showing us that he did use them. And the same thing with the Rebbe. Think of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. 
He, he never left New York City. Yet his tentacles were all over the world. When he told someone to buy a stock, all of a sudden the whole stock market changed. That when he, world leaders would come to him and he would give them advice. Um, in the Intifada, he told the people not to take their children, that, that Israel would be fine. When, whatever he did and whatever he advised would always be correct. And he, he was able to delegate through his shluchim. In fact, there's an interesting story that he was so connected with his emissaries, which again, we call shluchim, his messengers. An angel is called the shliach, a messenger of God. That his shluchim, that in Toronto, one day the Rebbe was troubled. And he called every shliach, every one of his emissaries in Toronto, and somehow they had all taken a nap that afternoon. And he felt uneasy because he didn't feel their, their vibes, their power that he was connected to. And again, the strength comes, even though they were all over the world and still are, from him being in one place. And that's really what a leader gives. That's what a good leader does. He gives strength to all of the pieces that are around. And they all take from his strength. And that's what it's about to delegate. Because you really give pieces of yourself. I always tell my employees that it's very simple. Whenever you do anything, just think that I'm next to you. Would you do it? And there's the answer. If you would do it if I was there, do it. If you wouldn't do it if I was there, don't do it. So all of a sudden, whether I'm there or not, if they actually utilize that, then they're able to use my strength whenever I'm not around just by virtue of that little advice. So the key becomes in order to do this, so God tells us this. Now, the real question is, do we really, so is, is a man greater than an angel? And the answer is yes. We see that in order for an angel to say God's name, it has to say three words, kadosh, kadosh, kolosh, holy, holy, holy. With us, all we need is to say Shema Yisrael, and then we say God's name, two words. A convert is even greater than any. We see with Yisrael. He said Baruch, one word, blessed, and then God's name. So we see that man is greater. In fact, it says when the Messiah will come, that the angels will ask us, where is God? So as close as they see to, are, are to God, they still don't comprehend God in, in that complete way. Now, what is also interesting is angels, we have a direct line with God, that every nation has a Sar, has an archangel, that we know that with the Egyptians, it says they saw Mitzrayim dead on the sea, seashore. Singular. It should say the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians. It just says Egypt. Because that angel, all, ba all battles, we believe, are, are fought in heaven. Everything is done above and then comes down. Our world is a reflection of the world above. So every nation is represented in heaven. The, what we're represented by is God Almighty himself. And there's really, even though Michal is considered to be the angel of Israel, so to speak, but God is the one who is our benefactor. And it's interesting that when we do a good deed or a bad deed, we create angels. And that when we finish our lives, we are greeted by these advocates and accusers. And it's proof positive what we've done. We learned that out from Abraham Avinu when he brought Yitzchak up as a sacrifice at the Akedah that the angel tried to stop him. And meanwhile, God was the one who told him to bring Yitzchak as a sacrifice. How can an angel stop him? And the angel said, look at me. I am the angel you've created through this good deed. I'm perfect. You've done all that God has asked. And that's how Abraham was able to know that what he had done was perfect. It's interesting that the angels, when we say Kaddish, a prayer of praising God, it's in Aramaic. Because somehow angels don't understand Aramaic. So this is the direct connection, one of the reasons why we have a direct connection with God when we say Kaddish for a beloved person who has passed away. That, that goes directly to God and no one else. So even though angels are intermediaries, they're limited in their connection with us. Especially because God is our Father and the only one that knows your thoughts is God Almighty himself, not even angels. So as great as they are, we still have a direct connection with God. And one needs to know that. Why does God have angels? Because when he wants to communicate with us, as he told, as he told Moshe, a man cannot see me and live. 
So every place in the Torah where people have a connection, a revelation with an angel, they're able to live through it. Were they to have a, re a revelation with God, it would be like being directly in the sun. No man can, could live through that. On the other hand, we can look at the rays of the sun and be able to deal with them. So angels, so to speak, are those rays. And we're able to deal with that as a communication with God on a very high level for people that are able to do that. But again, God teaches us so much by having the angels. And it's important. Always remember, you can be greater than you are by connecting to people and being able to direct them and make them extensions of yourself and grow from their, your relationship with them by bouncing things off of them. And this is what God teaches us by having angels. Again, thank you very much for coming, and I uh, hope you see an angel soon. Have a great Shabbos.